Please welcome up Sense Network's founder and CEO, Greg Skibiski. Great, thanks, Brady. Thanks very much, um, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, my name is Greg Skibiski. I'm the CEO of Sense Networks. Uh, I'll introduce a couple of the people in the company. Uh, you heard from Sandy Pentland, one of our other co-founders this morning, who talked about uh, reality mining. One of the other co-founders um, is Tony Jabara. He's the head of the machine learning lab at, at uh, Columbia University. And uh, we're the guys that analyze really large um, data sets of spatiotemporal data, so massive amounts, um, uh, billions and billions of points of latitudes, longitude, timestamp, um, unique ID, and hopefully um, some sort of uh, error measurement uh, on that data. So what I'd like to talk about uh, a little bit today is uh, demographics. I think we're all familiar to some degree with um, uh, the kind of demographics that uh, you know, we imported from the UK in around 1979 and sort of took, o took over uh, and a new life of itself with, uh, with direct mail. But uh, where does this come from, right? So this is self-reported information. Um, it's a census block. It's a, it's a level that we feel comfortable with as humans, that, that you know, I'm okay that I live in a house that's on a certain block, that's in a census block, which is about four, uh, four square blocks. And you know what, it's okay that people know something about my block area, and it's okay that some people know publicly that I live in this block area, and you can inherit stuff from the, the block area census to me in an anonymous enough way that, uh, that I'm okay with that you use it for something. So it's, it's a good benefit um, you know, for what I, I give up in my privacy. So this is um, self-reported data. And uh, like I said, um, everything comes from, from the location of my home, all right? So um, you know, we have census data that comes from the government, but we also have um, data that comes from other uh, private sources, which can be quite expensive. But I think the most advanced one, uh, they actually do 150,000 uh, user surveys every year. And what they do is they classify consumers into uh, 66 different groups. Uh, and that's pretty much state of the art, um, even though it's, it's still self-reported. Um, and I always worry about self-reporting because it has bias error, um, which is uh, when Google made PageRank, they stopped looking at the page and they looked at who linked to the page and they removed the, the bias error, which was a little bit of the genius. So question is, um, is there uh, another source of data that we can use to understand what goes on in the real world? And uh, can we understand the world? And then if we can understand places and times and, and what's going on in the real world, then can we understand uh, people moving around as an individual in the real world and, and give them some sort of benefit uh, for people who want to share their information uh, in a certain way? So um, what we're looking at here um, is kind of a, uh, a roll up. This is a million people uh, on their cell phones doing uh, SMS calls, um, uh, data service in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Just to give you an idea of the scope of, of uh, the data that we look at from carriers. And we at Sense Networks really believe that, um, uh, of course, half the people on the, on the planet are creating location data, but it's the most uh, universal source of information that exists today, right? So latitudes and longitudes are the same here uh, as in Russia, as in um, uh, China. You don't have to translate latitude and longitude to, to double light kanji, right? It's the same data-driven approach um, everywhere in the world. And so we want to do something intelligent with this that's, that's very scalable around the world. So, the goal, really, um, of demographics uh, has always been to, to understand people, right? And using location data, uh, if we just look at user A and, and user B here, um, and the different colored dots are just time of day, um, are these people similar? Are these people um, different? Would they like the same bars, restaurants, uh, you know, music? Um, would they like the same stuff as, as, as each other? It's almost impossible to say because people never go to the same places at the same times. And a city is very different in the morning and, you know, versus the night, and so you have to categorize not only by what's the place, but, but which hour of the week um, is it that somebody goes there. But people do overlap semantically if we can understand what it means to be in that place. So before you can start to understand a person, um, first you need to really index the real world and understand uh, places. What does it mean to be in every place, on every time, on the planet? Okay? So what we do is we look at large data sets of location data, and we look at, for every place on the planet, where did everybody come from to go here? 
Where did everybody go after they left here? And for example, um, you know, if we're looking at two different bars, if people come from the same places to go to two bars, and if they go to the same places afterwards, it's probably the same kind of bar, right? It's the same thing that Google uses um, online to, to, uh, to index the internet and you know, on and on and on. Um, so we look at who are the people around me based on flow uh, in and out of the places that I go to at the times I go to them. Um, we look at uh, commerce. What are the businesses uh, around me? Is there legal and financial services, or is there restaurants and bars, or is there um, you know, college-related uh, stuff, or is there farm equipment uh, being sold, right? And then we also look at static demographics, um, you know, which is good because instead of uh, you know, just looking at where my home is and you know, inheriting demographics, what we can do um, is look at how I move through demographics for every hour of the week, do, and I inherit. You know, do, I, do I move through ethnic areas? Right? Do I move through rich or poor areas? So as people move around, we can sample uh, what it means to live in the real world. And so um, this is an example uh, of how we classify. Um, this is the top, figuring out the top 200 nightlife spots uh, in San Francisco. So what we've done here is we've identified the top 200 spots just on the data, and we looked at where everyone came from to go to those spots and where everybody went to after those spots. And this is for one hour of the week. It's so a Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. And instead of grouping these places by proximity, which is a map, we group them now by looking at the graph using this machine learning to group them by behavioral similarity. What kind of people are at these places at this particular hour? Now that we've grouped them by behavioral similarity, we can put this back on the map. And now we can say, without you know, any sort of tagging or user input or anything, just using a pure data-driven approach, now we can say that if you go to one of these places between 11 p.m. and midnight on a Friday, you are part of the blue tribe or the green tribe or the red tribe, and we're inheriting that about you. We're learning about you um, from that. And intuitively, on the lower left, if you look at kind of the area of the hate, um, you can see that, that there's only really one kind of tribe in the hate. It's a very isolated area, but if you look up at the top um, in the marina, you'll see there's three different places. You could be potentially part of three different tribes um, in the marina. And number of tribes is a post-processing, um, so it's completely arbitrary, by the way. And we, we use multiple different sets of different sizes. So the point is, um, ah. so the point is that let's say you know, we want to understand the tribes in a city, right? If you look at demographics, the old way, it was the same no matter what time of day you looked at it. It was always the same thing to be in this place and have your house there. But as people move around, it's very different. Okay, so if you look at um, noon on Tuesday, you see this pink area, which is the financial district. And this is just based on people moving in and out of the, uh, the area. If you look at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, the concept of financial district still exists, but it's much smaller. But if you look at noon on Saturday, the concept of, of uh, financial district, there is no such thing at noon on a Saturday, financial district. It's something else, right? So the computer's defining it. Same thing if I go to, um, you know, after midnight to a club district. That doesn't exist 2 p.m. on a Tuesday, right? So if you go there, we need to sample appropriately based on the people around you to learn about you. Now, once we have a good understanding um, of the real world, uh, and you know, this is done by uh, taking massive data sets, uh, crunching it in huge simultaneous calculations similar to indexing the internet, um, and then having an index, once we have that, now what we can do is take individual user data, um, you know, which should be opt-in, uh, of course, individual user data, and put it on top of this index. So as you go here, as you go here, as you go here, we're sampling from each place in each time that you go to, um, approximately a 500K long uh, vector uh, from every place and time you inhabit, right? And so now, what we get out of that is a huge matrix for each user. And the nice thing is that to understand and, and retain information about these users, um, you don't have to retain the, in, the, the original location data at all. So while I'm moving around, every time a location point comes in, we process it, we learn about the place, we store it as a probabilistic function in the matrix, right? The probability that at 1 a.m. on a Thursday you would be around a nightlife tribe that likes hip hop, right? So we're storing that as a probability. 
And then um, once we have these, these matrices, um, you know, we delete the location data right away, and it still has some K-level anonymization. So just like a census block, you, know, you live on a census block, but you know, you're still one of 100 or 1,000 people, we can still use your data because you're just one of 100 or 1,000 people. We don't have the original location data, um, you know, which is very important. So now once we have this matrix, um, what we can do is understand uh, people much better. And the matrix is complicated. So what we do is we use it for prediction. Sure, you could, you could do segmentation and say, show me the people who are business travelers who move around to these different areas and live in wealthy neighborhoods. Segment it. Sure, these people are college students. These people are whatever. But it's much better to say, use prediction algorithms, right? To say that here's some people, here's some observed behaviors, and I learn about what these people have done. I observe the, the known behaviors. They like this music. They went to this bar. Um, I learn from these observed behaviors, and then we build a prediction model, um, and then we deploy it on a really large scale. So what does that do? It's dynamic demographics, right? It's for recommendation, personalization, discovery. What it does is really um, offers at least a two, two times improvement over not using location data, which is a bottom line um, ROI in a lot of cases. And you can say, for example, if you're looking at an app store, um, which applications might I like to buy? Okay? You put location data in, you have the observed behaviors, and you can extrapolate it for 10 million people and rank which apps um, they might like to buy. And different predictors um, will be uh, good for predicting things for different people. Um, churn, we work with carriers to predict who's gonna leave my network, right? So it turns out that as people um, are going to leave a carrier network, they have specific patterns and changes of entropy um, in their life. It turns out, um, the models pulled it out automatically. Um, and so we do uh, churn modeling, which is twice as good um, as just using call feature data, which is the, uh, the gold standard today. Finally, um, local search. Um, we work with handset manufacturers, so you know, prepaid mobile carriers have no idea who their customer is. Uh, handset manufacturers also barely have any idea who their customer is, but they have this data. And what we do is, you know, if you open up your Maps application um, right now and we all search for restaurant, we'll all see the same thing. But later on this year, um, you won't see the same thing. Right? It'll learn about you, where you've gone, what you've done, what kind of person you are, and everybody will see different restaurants. Okay? You won't see the same ones as your 90-year-old grandmother and your 18-year-old um, sister. So to wrap up, um, you know, I think we've heard a lot about privacy and data ownership. Um, Sandy spoke about it this morning. Super, super important. Um, and last but not least, if you're hanging out in San Francisco, we do have a, a fun application that we give away for free. It's called CitySense. And uh, if you put it on your, you can just go to citysense.com where it's in the, uh, the, the iTunes store for free. And it shows, um, it has a big back-end feed of data from taxi cab companies, mobile phones. Um, and it shows you something very simple, which is just, where is everybody right now? And so you can go out for nightlife, turn it on. Here's the number one hotspot where everyone's going. It's real aggregate movements of people um, on a map for the first time. So anyway, lots to discuss. Um, thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm.